So um, what they knew, even in 1947, um, and this is in a Tulsa, Oklahoma newspaper, they said the most efficient nuclear war is not to explode bombs in the atmosphere or underwater in a lake or the ocean, but to explode them in rain clouds. It was a much more efficient way to rain out the, uh, the radiation into the environment. So you see that's exactly what they're doing. They're also using ocean currents to deliver the radiation to targeted areas. Um, so it's a covert nuclear war. Now, I went to Sri Lanka in November of 2009, and the Sri Lankans who are pendant, and basically they're, it's a population made up of people from the Indian subcontinent, but they've been independent for uh, thousands of years. And they told me that the U.S. military has asked them five times uh, if, if they could use the port it's a natural, very deep water port at the north end of Sri Lanka. It's in a very militarily strategic position because the military now wants bases where they can monitor the shipping traffic from the Middle East uh, with the uh, energy uh, supplies, the oil and gas, for Asia. And it has, those ships have to come down the Red Sea into the Indian Ocean, go through the Straits of Malacca, right past Malaysia, and then around uh, Vietnam and that region, the South China Sea, up into the Asian countries. So um, when I was in Hawaii working on the depleted uranium issue in the spring of 2007, there was also a U.S. Navy Pacific Command change where three uh, major admirals were doing um, interviews in the Hawaii newspapers. And what one of them said, Admiral Gary Ruffhead, who was the outgoing admiral, he said, we are moving 75% of our personnel and our ships from all over the world to the Pacific and that means Hawaii and Okinawa and um, that's mostly where their bases are and uh, he said we're not interested in the Atlantic anymore the Pacific is where it's happening and this is all about the energy uh, uh, traffic and also commerce so you see the Pacific is the new region and uh, this in uh, November and December of 2009, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission went to Hawaii with the Army Command and announced to citizens that they are not only increasing the amount of depleted uranium that can be stored in Hawaii at military licensed military facilities, but they're increasing the number of facilities so they are licensing facilities that were not licensed before and what this means if they're moving all this depleted uranium into the Pacific region we can expect more depleted uranium wars in Central Asia in the Middle East and um, and perhaps in other locations related locations where there are um, energy resources that we want to uh, take over so the 2008 United Nations report has just been published um, in November of 2008, of uh, 2009, and it's a report on changes in population and fertility from 1950 projected to 2050, and what it shows is that the United Nations has known and has reported for years that the population in the developed countries, the First Nations, has been steadily declining since 1950. The population in developing countries and in undeveloped regions um, or less developed regions has been declining since about 1960. 
and that is from the radioactive pollution from bomb testing and then the nuclear power plants. Uh, those emissions replace the nuclear bomb test emissions or radioactive pollution when bomb testing ended. But there is a very sharp increase from 1991 when depleted uranium was introduced in Iraq to the battlefield for the first time by the U.S. and the British. And there's a very, very steep increase in global diabetes mortality. It's a global epidemic um, from 1991 to 2000. Then they backed off on the amount of depleted uranium bombing they were doing, and the diabetes death rate uh, declined. But they're increasing it again now. And so um, I think that diabetes is the the most serious disease in the world now because pregnant women who do not receive good health care uh, and have diabetes do not produce healthy babies. So this would uh, cause infant mortality and uh, uh, even birth defects, especially in women in developing countries and third world countries where they don't have health care. So, we can definitely see the global impact now, the regional impact, and the local impact of using these depleted uranium weapons in Iraq and Afghanistan. And with the airflow charts that Peter Eyre, the retired British naval officer, uh, worked up for me, uh, it's, it's very, very obvious that they are uh, targeting Central Asia, Southeast Asia, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, and China. And of course, Japan is just right downwind and it gets all the rain too. So Japan also is being impacted by that depleted uranium pollution. And then just a week later, it's all the way across the Pacific and it's hitting North America. So um, we can expect very large increases in the next 10 years in chronic illnesses and uh, also in fertility. Now the most devastating um, report that I have is from the Haaretz newspaper in Israel in May of, 19, of 2009 and they reported that sperm quality in Israeli men has declined 40 percent in the last 10 years. They are using, the Israeli Defense Forces are using depleted uranium bombs that the United States nuclear weapons labs, Los Alamos and Livermore, are developing for them and also shipping to them. And Israel is exterminating the Palestinians, but they're exterminating themselves even faster. And the um, the sperm quality in men, when it reaches 20%, only 20% of the sperm is viable or motile, it can even move, um, a man is considered sterile. So in, in less than 10 years, the Israeli male population will pretty much be infertile. And um, uh, the Haaretz newspaper also reported at a sperm bank that 10 years ago, they turned away 35% of the young men who came in to make a sperm deposit because of poor quality sperm. And today, in 2009, it's 65% of the men are turned away because they have uh, sperm quality that isn't suitable uh, for a sperm bank. And um, so, it's a really a terrible story, it's a terrible truth, but people need to know so they can stop these weapons and these invisible nuclear wars. It's affecting all living things. And as soon as we turn it off, life can go on and life will recover. But it cannot recover and it will not go on if the radioactive uh, wars continue. And um, of course, I'm always hopeful and I don't think it's ever the end, or, or um, I'm, I'm never hopeless. Um, it's wonderful to be able to educate people and inform people about what's really happening and to use my background as a scientist to do that. Um, 
what we're really living under now is a totalitarian scientific oligarchy and this has been in the planning for hundreds of years. Finally, the scientists have developed the technologies that the oligarchy can use to establish a totalitarian state which is total control of humanity and that has always been their goal.